You need to be prepared. You're going to know what the pastor's talking about and be ready to ask questions, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, huh? Okay. Um, okay. I, yeah, that's fine. Uh, so we're starting on the book of Titus. I'm calling it Leading and Living Out the Kingdom of God because Titus talks about what those two things look like. What does it look like to lead within the kingdom of God and what does it look like to live out within the kingdom of God. So that's where we're going over the next several weeks and today I'm going to introduce the whole thing to you. So uh, if you will join me in prayer and we will see how Titus actually is a book that matters to us today. So let's pray. Father, I need your help, God. I need a Holy Spirit anointing and power to communicate this uh, this book that you have created to your people. So, Lord, I pray that you would do that, that you would give me your insights and wisdom as we study this together. I pray, God, that you would help me to communicate well and communicate clearly. In Jesus' name I pray. Father, I pray that your people would receive what you want them to receive. That God, as we as we talk today, that you would give us something for today, God. That this would not just be theology or history, but it would be life application, life altering transformation from you to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So most of us growing up, those of us who have grown up, uh, have had either a uh, either a parent or a boss or somebody in our lives, maybe a youth pastor or a pastor, who has mentored and cared for us, uh, our souls, and not just our um, making sure we do the job right. Okay, so I had one of those. I've had several of them actually. A couple of them, Bronco Hughie. Uh, Bronco was my very first uh, boss with Youth Dynamics. Youth Dynamics is a youth organization that I worked for, for those of you who, don't, who aren't, haven't been here before. Youth Dynamics is the youth organization I worked for for uh, 14 years. 13, 14. Um, and Bronco was my very first boss, and throughout my time there, Bronco uh, was always a friend and a co-worker, but more importantly, he was a mentor to me. Uh, he was a man that I could go to with any problem, any struggle, any whatever, and Bronco would know how to uh, speak into that, into my life, and give me words of wisdom and encouragement. Uh, and, and he was able to do that, not because he was just so wise, though he was, but because Bronco took the time to get to know me. He took the time to pursue relationship with me rather than just be my boss, which it would have been very easy for him to do. In fact, even now, I look forward to the notes uh, of encouragement, especially on my birthday. He, he has, I've been out of Youth Dynamics since 2006, and he has never forgotten my birthday. Now, Facebook does help with that, <laughs> but that being said, he has always sent me something on my birthday. I know, uh, a, a card, a, something on Facebook, just saying, hey, or text, just saying, hey, happy birthday, hope you're doing well. Uh, so that's, that's Bronco, and he was, he was and is an encouragement to me, and it's fun to watch him as he was already a grandfather multiple times over, and um, just watch how God's still using him to be an Pastor Sal was our pastor in the praise, at the Praise Center in Wenatchee, and Pastor Sal was the pastor that helped me become a licensed pastor myself. He was the one who came alongside of me. He saw what God was doing. He, uh, he said, you know what? I want to assist you in this. I want to encourage you. I want to walk with you through this process. And he didn't just do this because uh, he, I was somebody special or something. He did this because God laid it on his heart. You see, um, we went to church there for about nine months. And again, Pastor Sal was another one that pursued relationship with me. He got to know me and my heart in those nine months. Then we left. And then after seven years, I came back to him and I said, Pastor Sal, I know I haven't been up there for seven years other than an occasional visit. I was only an hour and a half away. 
But I said, do you, can you help me? I believe God's calling me to pastor and to shepherd and be a lead shepherd. And Pastor Sal said, sure. And he sat down that week and wrote me a letter of recommendation to the regional director of four square denominations. So the guy in Tacoma that looks over all the Pacific Northwest. He didn't have to do that. I hadn't been to that church for months or years, but he chose to do that. He spoke into my life, and over the next year, he continued to pour into my life. This is what mentors do. This is what men do who, who speak into the younger people and encourage, equip, and help them become the men that God has called them to be, or the women. And uh, speaking of, for me, the men that God's called me to be. But there are people in our lives, men or women, who speak into our lives. We want those people. We need to be looking for those people. That's a whole other sermon. But here is my point. As we go into Titus, Titus, like me, was younger, and he had a mentor in his life, Paul. Paul led Titus to Christ. And I'll get into that in a minute. But Paul is the one who spoke into Titus's life. He, uh, this, this letter is a letter of encouragement to him. It's a letter of direction, yes. But it's also a letter that, because Paul couldn't be there himself, Paul wrote this letter so that Titus would have something to show people. It was Paul's way of being there, at least in spirit, to come alongside side Titus and say, this man, to, to everybody, to all the other churches, this man has my, I have his back. He has my backing. Okay, I stand behind him. Whatever he says is, is if I were there. So this was an especially encouraging letter for Titus. So let's jump into this. And I'm going to use the first few verses of Titus to kind of give you a, a background of where this letter is coming from and where it's going. So, uh, let's jump right in. Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. That's a very long introduction. <laughs> to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Savior. Okay, so we're going to start with the fact that uh, Paul is writing to Titus on Crete. Um, I left that list off. I can't believe I did that. That should have been one through six. Was five. it up there? Yeah, five too. He had it up there. There it is. Okay. I didn't put it on here. That's interesting. Okay. So this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Okay. I've never done that before. All right, so working our way backwards. First of all, let's talk about Crete. Okay, Crete is, is a little island nation. Go ahead and put that map up there, would you, bud? So this is Crete. It's just south of Greece. Actually, I believe it belongs to, to Greece right now. Um, to, at the time, though, it was a little island nation. Uh, I don't know how many people they had, but it wasn't real well populated. But it was known historically to be a people who were tremendously immoral. In fact, there is a Greek word. This word means to lie, but what it says is to cretize. They were so well known for lying that the Greeks came up with a word for lying that said to cretize. That's, that's the type of people the people of Crete were. Okay? Um, there's a couple of historians, one guy named Polybius, who said, it is almost impossible to find personal conduct more treacherous or public policy more unjust than in Crete. 
And Cicero, who was another historian, a philosopher, a statesman of the time, said, moral principles are so divergent that the Cretans consider highway robbery honorable. But only if you did something. No, that's my end of quote. So they were very well known. And Paul mentions this a little later in the letter. They were very well known as being immoral, as being lying was not a big deal. And so if you look at, now, obviously not everybody was like this, okay? There were people who had morals on Crete. There were people who were good people in Crete. But if you look at our nation, now, I don't think that sort of thing could be said of our nation yet, but it certainly could be said that our nation is, is not, it has long ago it quit embracing godly morals. Our nation, uh, and, and yet, I understand, that's a broad brush. And yet, what is true is that um, when we look at our leaders, how many of our leaders have no problem with lying, have no problem with twisting the truth as long as it fits their, uh, what they want to have said. So I say that to say that our, while our nation is certainly nowhere near as bad as Crete, the problems that Paul is going to address on the island of Crete could cer are certainly in our nation. And we need to know how to address them as followers of Christ just as much as Titus did at the time. So let's talk a little bit about Titus. He was a friend of Paul's. Um, as Paul had led Titus to Christ sometime in his early years. In fact, it was during, uh, it was just after Paul's first missionary journey. So Paul had been a Christian for a year or two, or three, I'm not exactly sure how long. And somewhere in the course of his missionary journey, his first missionary journey, he had led Titus to Christ. Now, Titus was a Greek. Greeks and Jews do not get along, did not get along. I don't know about now. Greeks and Jews did not get along. The Greeks were, uh, because of their number of gods, the whole idea that there were multiple gods, and then the Jews had only one god. And so that alone, and then the Jews, of course, thought they were better than the Greeks because they, they worshipped the true god. And so there was always this, this bonk in heads between the Greeks and the Jews. And I say that, and, and they did not like each other. And I say that because it is a testimony, and it is an example that Paul brings out in other letters that he wrote, that Titus gave his heart to Jesus. Titus, a Greek, Paul led him to Christ and discipled him. And Paul saw something in Titus and said, I am going to mentor you, I'm going to build you up, and I'm going to teach you how to lead. Titus was a man with both tact and authority that Paul had taught how to lead, Paul had, had mentored and, and brought up, and now he was sending Titus out to do different jobs. So if, if we look through 2 Corinthians, we see Titus' name come up often. Um, Titus helped lead the Corinthian church for a short time after Paul's first letter trying to help them to get that stuff straightened out. If you have ever read 1 Corinthians, you see that the, the church in Corinth was really messed up. They had a lot of things that they were not doing well. And so Titus was a part of the people, one of the people that Paul sent out there to help them get that all straightened out. And then when Paul sent his second letter to the Corinthians, he sent it with Titus. And one of the goals of his second letter to the Corinthians was to get the Corinthians to come through on the commitment they had made to raise up money for the Jerusalem Christians who were going through some, uh, getting them ready for a famine that was coming up that had been prophesied about. So, and, and also, the money was also there supposed to help the poor. So, if you can imagine being sent to a church to get them to actually come through on their com financial commitment, the kind of tax and, and yet authority that Titus had to have. This was a man who knew how to talk to people in such a way that, um, what's that definition of diplomacy? Where uh, getting them to do what 
you want them to do and think they want to do it? Something like that. This was, this was Titus. And yet he was also a godly man, a, a man who knew how to walk with Jesus. And so now he's in Crete. Paul has, Paul has left him in Crete. They've gone to Crete together um, after Paul's first captivity in Rome. They've gone to Crete together, and Paul left Titus there to kind of uh, get things settled, as he said, to uh, get some leaders in the church and, and get things organized. So Paul wrote to Titus, and this introduction, as long as it is, lays the groundwork for both the purpose of the letter and Paul's authority in writing it. As Titus had this common faith, this common faith that Paul talks about, Titus, my true child in a, com in a common faith, we have that same common faith. And so what I'd like to do is I would like to go through some of the things Paul said to Titus about our common faith <coughs> and to remind us of what is true about this faith. So, number one, Paul knew his identity. We have an identity, and our identity is in Christ. This letter is from Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Servants of God and messengers to our neighbors, friends, and family of God's love and grace. That is what we are. That is who God has called us to be. We aren't just Christians. We aren't just a religion. We are people who are servants of God. And this is not based on what others might see. This is what is true of us, whether we feel like it or not. And Scripture really, uh, there are a ton of Scriptures that help us to understand and to see this. Neil T. Anderson in his book, The Bondage Breaker and Victory Over the Darkness, lists at least 36 New Testament verses declaring who God says we are. Romans 8, 14 says, we, or you, all of us, are a son and daughter of God. Ephesians 2, 10 says, we are his workmanship. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 says, we are a dwelling place of God. Christ lives in us. So, Paul knew who he was. He made sure Titus knew who he was. We need to remember who we are. We are not just A truck driver, a pastor, a kid, an old man. This is not who we are. Who we are is children of God. And knowing who we are helps us to walk out what it means to be a follower of Christ. Number two, as servants, as messengers, as children of God, we have his authority. We walk in his power. Listen to what Paul said. Uh, and there's two versions I really like that say this well. I encourage God's own people to have more faith and to understand the truth about religion. Or in the New Living Translation, it says, I have been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. God has chosen us. We did not choose him. He chose us. He loves us. And as we learn to receive that, we learn how to trust God. We learn how to have faith and understand his truth and his ways of doing things. And as we learn to have faith, as we learn who, what his truth is, as we read our Bible and as we in, uh, internalize it, we learn how to walk in the authority God has given us. The daily learning, it's not something that occurs if I just have enough head knowledge, I'll be okay, but it's something that we practice and walk out on a daily basis. And over time, like watching our kids grow, over time, we grow into that authority that God has given us. And that authority, that faith, and that truth, it's got to lead into godliness. If, if we are getting all of this head knowledge, if we're reading the Bible, if we are uh, 
spending time with other Christians, we're listening to the pastor preach, if we're doing all of this, and all it is is just going to our head and staying there, and not translating into a life change, a transformation by God, if it's not translating into godliness that Paul talks about, then our authority becomes useless and powerless. And our prayers, God starts working on us first before he even answers our prayers sometimes. Conversely, as we pursue God in his character, his power and authority flow through us to impact the world around us. Our godly actions, such as loving those who don't love us back, our godly actions, such as loving our enemies, or maybe even the signs and wonders that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, those types of things come out as we live out our lives with godliness and with hope and encouragement. So we, we walk in his power and our lives are transformed by, by in, into being godly uh, lives. We have an identity. We are children of God, not just anything else the world wants to put on us. And we are called to proclaim the hope of eternal life. And we talked a lot about this when we were going through the first few chapters of Acts. So I'm not going to, to land real hard on this, but I want to read this. Um, Paul said, let me go back to it here. The hope of eternal life is in verse 2. For the sake of, faith, of the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. Eternal life. Not just heaven. Heaven's nice. Being with Jesus after we die, that's great. But eternal life is this. Jesus defines eternal life for us in John chapter 17, verse 3. And this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. So this is eternal life. We are called to share that eternal life with others, to help them to grasp it and to have hope in it. Acts chapter 2, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Through our actions and our words, we are called to be witnesses of this eternal life, of this hope that we have. So, three things that Paul brings out in his introduction. That we have an identity in Christ, that we are called to lives of godliness and encouragement and to be uh, Christ's hands and feet here on earth, to bring his kingdom into our world. And number three, as part of that, we are called to share the hope of eternal life that we have, this hope that, that we have in us we are called to share that with others. So Paul, in, in introducing his letter this way, sets Timoth Titus up to fulfill his purpose for being on Crete by summarizing that common faith. This is our common faith. As we go through this series, we're going to unpack this a lot, um, as you'll see. But uh, within this context, we're going to talk about Setting up leadership in churches. What does that look like? We're going to talk about false teachers and sound doctrine. What do those things look like? We're going to talk about what does it mean to live a godly life. As you go through Titus, Paul gives some very specific instructions. This is what godly living looks like. But for this week, my prayer for you is, or my invitation, let me put it this way. My invitation to you is, ask God, what do I need you to transform in me? Lord, do I need to know who I am better? Do I need to do I need you to do some work in me so that my life looks more like what you want it to look like? Or do I need to understand better how to how to share the hope that you have given me? Maybe I need to understand what that hope is. Maybe I don't fully grasp that hope yet. So my invitation to you is ask God, God, what do you want in this for me? What, how do you want to use this to transform me? And as you ask that, wait. 
wait, God, I'm listening. God, I'm not just going to say that and expect you to, to go poof. And all of a sudden this happens. I'm going to wait, I'm going to listen, and expect God to actually speak. Because he will. If we are willing to listen, he's willing to speak. So, let's pray. God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. What is this hope that you have given us? The hope of eternal life, of knowing you. Not just knowing about you, God, but interacting with you. Knowing your heart. And then living it out. Living out a godly life. Not because, not because we have to earn your love, but because, Lord, we are responding to what you're doing in us. God, I pray that you would make real to us the identity that you have given us as your children. The identity that you have implanted in us, changing our hearts, transforming our minds. God, help us to grasp and understand that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May God bless and keep you as you go out with this week. May he guide you as you uh, look for ways to share the gospel and to be his light in the community. Have a good week.